It's a mistake to believe that the development of the gun is a simple progression from the muzzle loader to the breech loader. In fact, the, the breech loader first comes onto the scene and then for centuries we have the muzzle loader dominant. This is a muzzle loader, although a rather late one, and one can see that there is no means of loading other than at the muzzle. Taking this as the type, the breech loader equally clearly demonstrates that the soldier has the facility of placing the cartridge in there. In closing the breech, the gun is cocked, ready for firing. By the beginning of the 18th century, the breech-loading weapon was beginning to come on for the scene for specialist applications. In fact, a few flintlock breech-loaders were issued to British troops in the late 18th century, like this one that was used by the Light Dragoon. The screw breech Ferguson was carried with success by some British troops in the American War of Independence. But militarily, no breech loader which loaded separate components was acceptable as a general issue weapon. The limited introduction into Prussian service in the 1840s of a bolt action needle rifle with cartridge loading marked the real arrival of the breech loader on the military scene. The British copied it at Enfield and tested it in 1850. They rejected it as unsuitable for extreme climatic conditions. The British imperial soldier had to contend with the unspeakable cold of Canada and the incredible heat of India and Africa. The needle pierced the paper cartridge case to explode a fulminate pellet in the middle of the charge. However primitive that may seem, the needle rifle was a military success. The French copied it in their famous Chasseau rifle. This was the arm with which the French forces were largely equipped in the Franco-Prussian War. It performed very well. The problem with any form of needle rifle was checking the escape of gas at the breech. A burnt thumb was not uncommon as a result of gas escape, and there was danger to the eyes. The means whereby the breech was sealed in the chaspo was a rubber obturator which expanded on firing to block gas escape. The rubber needed fairly frequent replacement to remain efficient. The needle which detonated the fulminate was subject to the great heat of the exploding charge and often needed changing after 20 or so shots. And before the next cartridge could be loaded, there was always a lot of debris from the previous firing to be shaken out. In the capping breech loader, often carried by the cavalry experimentally, the breech was usually sealed by an expanding metal obturator. Ignition was by percussion cap. One of the most famous of the capping breech loaders was the Sharps. The cartridge consisted of a cylinder of animal intestine or special paper attached to the bullet. The flame from the percussion cap easily penetrated the cartridge to ignite the powder. Wrapping a handkerchief round the action was a favourite 19th century demonstration of the extent of escaping gas. The results with this old sharps are a little unfair. At least one capping breech loader was so good as almost to be adopted by the British Army. As the French and Prussians abandoned their muzzle loaders and went over to breech loading arms, the British realised that they had to follow. In 1864, a competition was held to find a simple breech-loading conversion for muzzle loaders. The result was the Montgomery Storm capping breech loader, adopted generally for the army in 1864. Unfortunately, an adequate supply of good quality skin cartridges proved impossible to obtain. It was the end for the Mont Storm. The American Snyder breech design was adopted in its place. It depended on a metallic centerfire cartridge the first modern type of cartridge in British service with its own ignition. The Snyder was very successful. The only real trouble arose when the orphan boys of the Royal Laboratory, who assembled the cartridges, 
lift out one of the components and the cartridge burst in the gun. To prevent all possibility of the breech blowing open with a faulty cartridge, the Mark III Snyder was eventually introduced with a breech that was positively closed with a catch. Replacing the Snyder with an entirely new breech loading design proved very difficult. In a long competition, rising blocks, dropping blocks, bolts and every sort of device were tried. Of over a hundred designs submitted, only a few were seriously entertained. The bolt-action rifles were subjected to a particularly severe test to ensure that there was no danger of the premature ignition of a faulty cartridge. The result of this was that one bolt-action rifle alone passed, and that was this one, the Carter and Edwards. And in fact, it is a very fine bolt-action weapon. It couldn't be neater, and it was also pretty stout, but its main advantage was that it could have been converted quite easily to magazine loading later on. But it was rejected, and the reason for that rejection was a most unfortunate accident to Sir Henry Halford, one of the committee members. A cartridge went off prematurely, not in this rifle, but in another one, and he lost the end of his thumb. The committee's decision was that the rifle was to be rejected, and so the British Army delayed by 20 years the adoption of a weapon which could be used with magazine loading and they missed a weapon of considerable excellence, one which fired exceedingly well, and that was the price they paid. Private Warwick was perhaps the most remarkable shot of this period. With one of the competition rifles, the Sofa, he got off 60 rounds a minute, single loading, in two formal trials. This was a rate of fire never equaled by any magazine bolt-action rifle in British service but the SOPA was rejected as being too complicated. As the competition was narrowed down, the disappointing Burton No. 2 was dropped. The money and walker was rejected for its very awkward lever action. The Henry rifle, with a simple falling block design, almost made it, but in the end, Henry had to be content with the adoption of his barrel only. It was the Martini Breach which was declared winner in the competition. The Martini Barrel was rejected, but the very distinctive Martini Breach with its concave top and cocking indicator on the side was adopted for the British Army. The Henry Barrel and the Martini Breach were brought together to create one of the best known, if not best loved, of all British Army rifles, the .45 Martini Henry, formally adopted in 1869. It was immediately under attack for its mechanical design. In the Sudanese campaigns, the Martini Henry soon showed serious weaknesses. In particular, there were extraction difficulties, and when sand got into the action, it could become quite impossible to extract a spent cartridge. Many a serious situation around Sarkin and along the Nile was made yet more desperate by jammed Martini Henrys. A new model of the Martini Henry, the Mark IV, with a long lever to aid extraction, was introduced. But nothing was done to reduce the savage kick much complained of by the soldiers. In America, repeating rifles like the Winchester were catching on fast at the end of the Civil War. Such repeaters were rejected by the British as underpowered, suitable only for short-distance warfare. By the 1870s, the European armies were equipped with centre-fire developments of their needle-fire predecessors. But as black powder arms generated dense smoke, they could not easily harness the virtues of magazine-loading repeated fire. The French Lebel rifle of 1886 was the first smokeless powder magazine-loading small-bore rifle. With smokeless powder, the shooter could utilize the great firepower of a magazine-loading rifle simply because he could now go on seeing what he was firing at. With the Lebel, the genus of rifle had arrived which was to dominate the battlefield until the machine gun supplanted it. Britain was still armed with a single-shot Martini Henry. Efforts to convert it to magazine-loading were made. It was a challenge indeed. 
Even the best adaptations rarely belong to the world of Heath Robinson. This one was all right, as long as the soldier operated it muzzled down. In the end, it was appreciated that an entirely new design was called for. The Lee action was the one finally adopted by the British in 1888 in the 303 Lee Metford. When the original Metford barrel was dropped in 1891 because it did not suit cordite, the famous Lee Enfield had finally arrived. To begin with, there were various versions of Lee Enfield. For the infantry, there was a long rifle form. For the cavalry, there was a short carbine version. In the Boer War, the cavalry complained that the carbine did not shoot as well as the long rifle. The infantry complained about the weight of the long rifle. Both were abolished and the short magazine Lee Enfield made its debut in 1903, the famous SMLE. It was not long, however, before we were looking around for a better rifle, and the obvious choice was the Mauser 98. This is a Mauser 98. It had proved itself in South Africa, and it had some features which made it theoretically the best. When you open it, you can see that there are two large lugs at the front to lock it securely, and a third lug back here to make sure that if there's an accident it doesn't fly open. Moreover, the action cocked as the bolt was closed. The result was here that we produced a design, the Pattern 13 design, a design which went on to become the P-14. And had war been delayed, we would have found ourselves equipped in the British Army with a Mauser rifle, not unlike this one. A rifle of which the troops could have been proud what, in fact, we went for was something which actually proved rather better, the SMLE. The last basic improvement to the non-automatic rifle was rapid loading. Twenty years after the Germans, the British made the necessary modification to the SMLE. Alongside the Pattern 14 Mauser-type rifle, the SMLE can match and better the other gun's rate of fire. It was the phenomenal rate of fire achieved by highly skilled troops with the SMLE in the early phases of the Great War that led the Germans to believe that the British Army possessed a great many machine guns when it did not. Nineteen fourteen saw the zenith of the rifle, particularly in the British Army with the SMLE. The rate of fire then attained was exceedingly high, up to thirty-five rounds a minute but it was the product of a highly trained army and one which could not be replaced as the First World War wore on. In fact, the heyday of the rifle was the beginning of the machine gun's total ascendancy of the battlefield. Machine guns like this, the Vickers or the Maxim, were used on both sides extensively.